Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Uh, good morning. I, I'm so proud to be a member of your community. I'm proud that I got my PhD at MIT in the 1980s. I'm proud to be a member of the faculty now. I'm proud to be the part of the mission that you heard about this morning in the previous talks and from President Wright. And, uh, uh, and I'm excited that MIT is showing its commitment to excellence in education for all by establishing the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative. The goal of this initiative, uh, which I've been asked and I'm grateful to have the honor to direct, is to bring the best of science, engineering, and policy to figure out what works for learners and education. There's so much uh, issues in terms of society, economics, politics about education, where we can shine the light of science, technology, and policy to make education better for everybody, for the superstars at MIT, for the children born into poverty in this nation and around the world, for different kinds of learners for whom the standard curriculum you heard described you know, beautiful, poetically early, the standard curriculum is not the right curriculum. We want to revolutionize that by the power of scientific knowledge. That's our mission. Uh, uh, and you know, I, I need your help, as MIT does, and, and the scientists to do this. So let me give you a couple of examples of how we think neuroscience, the area I work in, is starting to give us some ideas about how we can make education uh, better for everybody at all levels of opportunity and from all kinds of different backgrounds and individualities. So here's something. Imagine you go visit a place like this, although in our boring experiments and imaging, you're in a tube in a scanner and you're seeing this in a mirror, okay? And when you have the best learning moments that you heard described earlier, sometimes we know we're ready to learn, right? That moment you're ready to learn. And sometimes it's been a tough day or the speaker's not that interesting or the topic is a little confusing and you're not ready to learn. Are we able to find in the human brain the moment of learning when you're ready to learn or the moment when you're not ready to learn. And on top of that, we, can we give you information when you're ready to learn that you'll remember? And can we give it a break when you're not ready to learn? I mean, that would be ideal, right? If we knew that the information we're conveying, whether it's in orally or digitally, is arriving in your brain when it's ready to learn or when it's not ready to learn. So here's the experiment. Um, person's lying in a scanner like this. Uh, and we're watching the natural fluctuations of oxygenation in their brain that reflects when different parts of your brain are more active or less active. You're just laying there doing nothing. It's sort of like you're in your, your chairs now. And uh, we're watching that display over time. And when a certain part of the, sorry? Ah, can, does, does somebody, do I have the power to do that? No. <laughs> Could somebody lower the lights who has the power to do that? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so we're watching these two areas uh, of the brain. They're in the so-called parapacampal place area, part of your gyrus. We all have them in the left and the right. And when these areas are either high or low, as you're just laying there, your brain state triggers us to present one of these pictures like you just saw. And uh, so when there's high or low. And then when you're done with that, we give you a test of your memory for the information. And what we find is this. If we send in the information when your brain is ready to learn, um, you remember it better than if we send in the information when your brain was not ready to learn. So we know we're not going to roll in multi-ton, multi-million dollar scanners into every classroom in the United States. We know we can't do that. But we know now with some scientific evidence that there is a signal in your brain when you're ready to learn and when you're not ready to learn. And we can see whether we can exploit that in terms of broad education application. We could not have known this without this technology, and we want to use this to create inspirational, effective learning for all students in as wide a situation as possible. Uh, another thing we can look at is brain structure. And so let me just give you a, a moment's video. So we're looking at an individual's brain anatomy, gray matter and white matter as we go from one ear to the other. And then we can measure the cortical thickness. So the surface of your brain has six layers of neurons that compute much of what are the intelligence of humanity. 
language, problem solving, thinking, and so on. And we can measure the thickness of that, which is a very coarse neuroscience measure, but it's a measure we can measure, take. And then we can look at eighth graders in the Boston school system and ask two questions. How does the thickness of the neocortex that empowers the human brain to learn and to think, how does that vary in relation to standardized test scores, how well you read, how well you do math? And how does it vary in relation to whether you have the luck to be born into a family with affluence or poverty and qualify for free or reduced lunch? How does that change the structure of the brain? And um, here's what we found. So let me say a word what you see here. This is the left and right hemispheres viewed from the sides, viewed from the ears. Everything that's in red and yellow means it's statistically significant. That's why it's colored there. And everything in red and yellow in this top panel is the thicker the cortex of eighth graders are going to Boston public schools, the better they do on standardized tests of reading and math. So that's one thing. And we expect that. There's a relationship between your brain and what you learn. In fact, you can't learn anything without a brain. All the learning is a brain mechanism, right? Um, down here, we do a second question. We divide the students into those who qualify for free or reduced lunch because of low family income or students who uh, don't qualify because their family makes more money than that. And this is the difference between children born to poverty or born to relative affluence, which is large and substantial. And not only do we find this, but many other researchers in the last years have shown this as well. So now two things happen. When people see this picture, sometimes they think it's very discouraging. It's no more discouraging than what we know is the consequence of being born into a family of low income and low education. We know that already in terms of educational outcomes, health outcomes, longevity, and every other measure of human well-being. It's something we just want to do better at for everybody, right? So, uh, and the brain is very plastic. It's stunningly plastic. We know that in many uh, animal research, but in human re research as well. I could show you picture after picture of human brains changing as they learn. We had a, a, a summer study where ch people learn Chinese. You should see how their brain processes Chinese now uh, after two months of learning compared to when it meant nothing to them at the beginning. The brain is phenomenally plastic. We can do amazing things, uh, but we have to recognize the challenges that are in front of us. Lastly, um, we have another method to look at not the gray matter of the brain, the neurons of the brain, but the white matter of the brain. So what's the white matter of the brain? Let me remind you that's the sort of the internet of the brain. That's a cabling of the brain. Uh, axons that talk to one another send out, uh, neurons send out axons. Those are myelinated. They're covered with myelin to communicate with other neurons at a distance accurately and quickly. And using uh, the flow of water in the brain, we can map out uh, the wiring of an individual person's brain. What this shows you is a single person. Where we see red, uh, those are that's white matter connecting your left and right hemispheres. Green is front to back of the brain. Blue is up and down in the brain. And we can make an approximate picture of how an individual brain communicates information from brain area to brain area. Practically everything we do that's interesting as a human is an orchestrated set of networks that are connected to one another to accomplish human thought, feeling, and action. So uh, one thing we know is that uh, there are many different kinds of learners. Um, and some children, for example, uh, struggle to learn to read. About 10% of children have something that's called dyslexia, an otherwise unexplained difficulty in learning to read. And one of the things that we want to accomplish is not only understand why that happens, but we know uh, that the earlier a child is, gets help, and there are pretty effective programs, none of them are perfect, but some of them help children considerably to learn to read. The earlier they get help, uh, the better they do uh, in most cases. The way things are set up now in schools, there's a wait to fail model, and this was referred to before, which is schools tend to wait until a child is so clearly so far behind his or her classmates, and they go, oh my gosh, you're a third or fourth grader or two years behind, now this triggers some, some action on our part. What if we could identify, as a child arrives at the beginning of kindergarten, before there's any formal reading instruction, which child is likely to become a poor reader? And what if we gave that help before the child ever felt behind? his or her classmates, before the child ever was discouraged about his or her prospects in academics and school. And so this combination of behavioral analysis and brain imaging, we've been looking at 2,000 kindergartens from 20 diverse schools in the Boston area and asking whether we can see differences in the brain before a child gets his or her first reading instruction in school that will help us identify who will struggle to read and therefore ought to trigger help to children before they fail. And here's an example. Um, this is a, a, the white matter pathway that connects the two major language areas of the brain, Broca's area in the frontal cortex 
and Wernicke's area in the temporal cortex. It's called the left arcuate fasciculus. And here are two kindergartners, and these are representative of the sample overhaul. A child who, uh, uh, had, who we identified uh, through behavioral testing, but also this brain difference, who by the end of first grade is really falling behind. We're following these child children to know, can we measure something at the beginning that predicts who will struggle and who will not? Here's a child who arrived in kindergarten with this kind of arcuate fasciculus, larger and differently organized. She's a fine reader at the end of first grade. So we think that through a combination of measures, including these brain measures, we will be able to identify children with a wide variety of risks and bring help to them before they ever fall, not waiting for failure, but helping everybody in an individuated way. And technology will certainly play a fantastic role in individuated tech, uh, education to help different kinds of learners, and there's a huge variety of learners, you know, blossom uh, and have express their full potential and not be blocked by one kind of learning that's difficult for them. So we're very excited through this MIT Integrated Learning Initiative to bring the best of science, engineering, and policy uh, to shine the light of sort of honest research where we can in education and to be a partner to all the other parts of the educational make it, uh, communities and making differences for children pre-K through 12, undergraduates, and continuing adult education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.